Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, welcome to the Community Tech Data Hub Workshop. Today's session will be on uh, real-time uh, IoT analytics. Um, my name is Vladimir, and I'm part of the Community Tech team. A few housekeeping notes. First, a reminder that this session is being recorded, so it can be shared at a, a later date for companies to view and refer back to. I'll ask that you please keep your microphone on mute while others are presenting today. Um, this session is designed to be interactive and you will have opportunities to ask questions throughout. Um, I will ask that you use the raise hand feature by clicking on the reactions button below, then uh, click on raise hand. Uh, you can also use the, uh, the chat functionality for your questions if you wish. Uh, we ask that you post your questions to the entire group instead of messaging any one of us individually so that our um, event support team as well as the speakers can see your questions. Uh, the present presentation component of this uh, session will carry us to about 3.30 today, and the presenters have kindly offered to hang around afterwards to continue the conversations with you and answer any questions you may have. Online, you can find us at uh, communitech.ca slash data. In terms of what we do, through our services, we help companies um, innovate with data, and this can mean uh, data labeling projects, uh, mentorship around data, or funded projects with access of up to $50,000 in funding. Um, again, visit communitech.ca slash data for more information. I'd like to thank uh, Encore for supporting our advanced technology platform and making this Data Hub workshop possible. Encore is a partnership made possible in part uh, by funding from the Canadian government and the provincial governments of Quebec and Ontario. In Ontario, Encore is coordinated by the Ontario Centre of Innovation. Uh, today's speakers are Avi Borgava and Riyad Parvez. Avi is the co-founder and CTO at Yuko Agro, an agricultural technology startup. He has an electrical engineering degree from McMaster and has 12 plus years of collective experience in designing business and technology strategies, leading complex technology solution implementations and managing uh, scaling up operations. Riyad is the senior software engineer at Yuko Agro, where he works on data infrastructure, analytics and machine learning for IoT devices. Riyad has a master's in applied science from the University of Waterloo. Now I'll end it off uh, to Avi for the first part of the workshop. Thank you. I'll start sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can. It is, however, still in, in presentation oh, mode. No problem. I'll just choose that. Perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, glad to be here and, and thanks for having us. Uh, we're very excited to be, be here. So Yuko Agro, we, what we do is we help farmers grow more crops in a sustainable way. And uh, the, in the next few couple of slides, what we'll go over is, we'll try, first of all, we'll try to set the context here. Uh, when you think about agriculture industry, uh, often it's not related to the amount of data there exists. So we'll first of all try to set up the context on why do you even need that much data, and 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 then where is technology there right now, uh, and what's the level of that, what's the standards there, and from that point uh, we'll move on to understand where uh, is this industry going in terms of technology specifically, and how do the changes are coming along, and, and lastly the topic of today, which is how there's IoT sensors and devices as well as machine learning when they work hand in hand. How that, how that can bring shift in the industry. And we present a solution that we, are, we have built slash continue uh, is also, also in the process of growing. And, and lastly, what are some of the practical change, challenges around the IoT and machine learning? When you, come, when you talk about building solutions, not only from ground up, but also when you're trying to scale them up. So uh, customers which are uh, more on the commercial side can even use them. And from that point, we'll move on to uh, a hands-on uh, workshop with Riyad the lead. And why don't we get started on this? So this this was uh, this is the 
this is a slide that actually, this is the message that got us started when we started UCO Agri about three, more than about three and a half years ago. So food production globally needs to increase by at least 60% to match the kind of speed, kind of, uh, the kind of uh, pace the population is going at. And we're not on a track to make that happen. Uh, we are not saying at a UCO Agro as we are the company who's actually doing that or trying or will, you know, by one, by just by ourselves will improve that. But we are a company who's working at the grassroots level with farmers to make a big dent at this. So how do we get there? And what's really the challenge there? The challenge here is that if you, so we want to increase crop yield, I think that's pretty clear, but we also want to reduce the crop input. So what are crop inputs? So crop inputs like water that's required, uh, fertilizers, pesticides. Uh, so all of that are crop inputs that, that go in in terms of growing crops. Now, if you increase the crop input, more water, more fertilizer, et cetera, that does not mean the crop yield increases. And that brings us to the point that the major challenge here is how do you increase crop yield sustainably, which, and hence we introduced the term here, uh, sustainable commercial agriculture practices. The reason why we're talking about the word commercial here, because are the clients we work with and the people who are actually feeding the world, they, they work on a commercial scale. The farm size that we're talking about can be 5,000 acres, 10,000, 20,000. We even work with a farm, with, a, with, a, with an organization that owns about 150,000 acres. And that's just one farm. And so you can you get the idea of the commercial scale we're talking about. So what we're really talking about here is bringing that sustainability aspect into that, uh, that scale. So thinking a little bit deeper into this. So what are sustainable agriculture practices here? So what does it even mean? What it means is the first of all, the practices needs to be environment economically viable. So, as, as a, so farming is a business. As, as uh, uh, where farmers need to make sure, or the organizations need to make sure they're 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 financially sustainable. If if the, if an operation is not financially sustainable, it's hard to sustain, right? And the second, and then not second, but uh, equally important point, it has to be environmentally sound and also protect public interest. When these three pillars come together, that's when we call a sustainable agriculture practice. So, how do you get there? So the way to get there is you need to first optimize irrigation. So as I was making the point before, uh, more water does not mean you can have more yield. Uh, that just means you've used more water. And, and in many cases, it can be actually bad for the crop as well. Uh, we need to optimize pesticide application. So we do hear often that uh, in the media that pesticide are, pesticides are bad, but that's not really true. I mean, overuse of medicine is bad for humans. Similarly, overuse of pesticide is also bad, not just for the crop, but also for environment and also for public. And the, the point here is if used in right proportions and right uh, amount at the right time, uh, it can be actually very beneficial. It can increase crop yield. And lastly, increase adding the, that micro and macro nutrients such as fertilizers and uh, you can think about other, some, of the chemical, some of the other pieces that go in there. So they also needs to be optimized. So, but how do you even find that out? Now, this is where it, this is where the data portion comes in. So you need to understand that how, when when do you need how much water should you be using, how much pesticide, how much micronutrients and macronutrients. So when we will take a pause at, uh, at this for a minute, and then we'll try to take a look at okay, where is technology here? Right? Like how does that fit into this whole environmental? Uh, sustainable agriculture practices, and somewhat we talked about data. So technology is shaping the sustainable practices. So when we look at agriculture 1.0, which we, as we know it, are the traditional agriculture practices where people were uh, massively dependent on, first of all, the, the, uh, the rain that was coming in to feed their, their plants. Uh, they also looked at how their, their previous generations basically did uh, farming, which is looking at uh, taking the soil in the hand and try to, feed, try to feel, is it dry? Is it not so much dry? And then making the judgment call, do, should I irrigate my, my, uh, my crops? And then using chemicals because, hey, my neighbor is using it, so I should start using it. So probably there's some sort of disease coming and I have a gut feeling I should apply uh, pesticides. 
So those, these were all traditional agricultural practices. And they were fine to a great extent when the population was not that and not growing at that pace. Then came agriculture 2.0. So this is, this is fairly recent as well. So now we've started hearing about farm digitization. So on the, the image that, that we are looking at, so this is actually a field that has been digitized and you can see different fields on a computer screen grid. Uh, often you might have heard about drone or imagery uh, based services, which are uh, which 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 made a lot of buzz in the which was a lot of initially made a lot of noise in the industry for good reasons. They they give a lot of data to farmers which they didn't have. Now farmers could fly these drones or UAVs on their field, and then figure out what's really happening on my field now. And it kind of gave something like on the right hand side it says early detection analysis, which is you see that red, that's where your plants are probably dry. They need some water or uh, on the green, they look good. So you don't have to do it. Now, this was all great. So where is the industry going and where, what led to the, to the change in the industry? Moving to agriculture 3.0, which we'll talk over the new slide. So when you, when you analyze agriculture 2.0 very clearly and we talk about the scale you were talking about, remember 150,000 acre farm, 50,000 acre farm. By that time, all this analysis was done, by the time all this information was provided to someone, farmers knew what they had to do. So yes, the technology advanced things, yes, they could see it, but very soon they started to realize this is actually a bit of a lagging indicator. I already know what needs to happen, and I'm looking at, you're just confirming what needed to happen. So it's, it's not massive value to me. Yes, there's a value, but not massive. Then came, then, then started agriculture 3.0. And that's, the, that's where we have, we have that's, the, that's the time, that's, the, uh, that's where we are at right now. We are entering, we have, we have entered that already. So this, and this agriculture 3.0, where this is coming from is so becoming more leading side to it. And the main goal uh, or the heart of this agriculture 3.0 is enabling sustainable agriculture practices at scale. And as, as you're building up this story here, you can see that why at scale and the sustainable practices are coming in one sentence, which was missing in agriculture 2.0. So how do you get there? So there are three pieces to it and they all connect. So first of all is the monitoring. In order to tell someone or a farmer, it doesn't matter what scale you're talking about. First of all, everything needs to be monitored. What's going on in the field right now? So once you understand what the current state is, what's going on right now, good or bad, Based on that, farmers need to know, okay, what action do I take and where do I even go? The challenge they have is if, when you look at the, the scale you're talking about, they don't have equipment that can cover all the fields at a given time. So there's always a choice they have to make, where do I send my equipment? The cost of sending equipment, which think about massive machineries, or in certain cases, they're using uh, small propeller-based planes to even spray their fields. It's a high cost, so it's a decision that Anytime they say it's Spain, I have 20 fields on this side, but not on the 10 fields on the other side. And imagine making that decision wrong. So they can potentially lose your crop or reduce the quality of the crop, which regardless is, is bad. Or other scenario of that is overspraying. So all those pieces in, in the sustainable agriculture practices we talked about. So it goes against that. So predict is where we come to, uh, when, when you monitor uh, what's going on in the field and going back to the point, so what exactly needs to happen and where? That's what needs to happen here. That's what needs a farmer at that scale needs to know. And once you know uh, what is the right action needs to be taken and where, an action needs to be taken, which is the equipment needs to act on it. And once an equipment have acted on it, which is we call it just, because so they, they have, uh, the situation is averted, crop, crops are saved and they grow nicely, that cycle has to keep going on and on throughout the growing season. So that's what it means to be uh, to achieve agriculture 3.0. So before we move forward, um, I don't see any question yet, Vlad. I don't know if any questions are coming on. Um, there's there are no raised hands at the moment, uh, folks. I'm okay. just wondering, um, anyone in the audience, uh, do you have any questions right now? Um, please uh, feel free to uh, use the raise hand feature or, or pop a question in the in the chat. Okay, so we'll continue. Mm -hmm. So IoT and machine learning are leading agriculture 3.0. How is that happening? How do, so this is where, where the whole story connects, which is 
So when you talked about the, all the data points, which is you need to know how to optimize uh, irrigation, optimize fertilizers, optimize pesticides. So, and, and the scales we're talking about are hundreds and thousands of acres. So many data points, so many decisions that needs to be made. So first of all, someone has to collect all this data in a way that is meaningful. And then the quality is high. And then, so that's where IoT sensors are, are leading the way. So this image where it says monitor and uh, just right here, these are actual real sensors that our company has deployed in, I, I believe this one is in Manitoba and the other one is in, is in Saskatchewan. So what this device looks it has, is it has a wind speed, uh, wind direction. It has a solar radiation sensor on it. Uh, it has temperature, relative humidity and rain gauge. So it's collecting all environmental parameters. And, I, and if I remember this correctly, this is installed on, uh, on a wheat field. So it's collecting all this data. And this device, which is looking a little bit different, uh, this is a soil probe, which has, uh, which, which, uh, uh, which measures sort of temperature and relative and, and soil uh, moisture at different depths. And they connect to LoRa uh, protocols uh, to each other. And they upload the data every 15 minutes from this field to our servers. So, so imagine now, uh, these are the kind of devices that are deployed everywhere. So they're capturing every 15 minutes what's going on. They help capture uh, because the, and the weather is changing now. If you talk to anyone who has been in the agriculture industry and ask them, how's rainfall? That's by the way, is a favorite topic for growers or farmers. So what they'll tell you is, well, it's highly localized now and it's kind of unpredictable. Climate change, there's a lot of climate change, change effect. And these devices are capturing that every 15 minutes. And once we have this information, so what goes on from there is they come to, we, what we as a company do is, we, we are combining plant science and machine learning in building algorithms that are constantly reading from these data streams. And then based on that, trying to tell growers that out of your 150,000 fields, 10 fields that you have, they need to be sprayed in three days. The other five fields do not spray at them. Reason being the kind of uh, seed that you have used, they are quite resistant. And the disease pressure we see that's gonna come in, it's, it's, it'll be okay, you don't have to spray. And by the way, those potato that you're growing, they need to be irrigated in five days from now on. Do not irrigate it right now. And 20 days from, or 10 days from, from, from now in a different area, which is fire, because there's a localized shower we can see coming through. You don't need to irrigate there because there's enough water that rain is gonna bring in for you. So all that analysis, all that actionable forecasting is what this site is generating and giving it to uh, and then farmers are acting on it. But where would it, it go next uh, is this will feed directly into the connected equipment. And that's again where IoT and smart equipment comes in. So if, uh, if, you, if you know, there's a company, uh, John Deere, which, which is very famous and uh, some of the other companies as well. The equipment they have, so this is, this is one of the John Deere tractors. It has, I, I wanna say at least close to 1000 sensors on it. And it is very smart. At this point, you can even enter the coordinates of your field and this device, this machine will just go in, keep doing what it needs to do on its own. So it's fully autonomous. And in fact, agriculture industry is one of the very first industries which is, uh, which is highly adopted the autonomous machinery and equipment at this point. What it doesn't know at this point is that smart, that, uh, uh, that smart or the intelligence, which is when, where, when do I, when, where do I act on it? With the, with the autonomous feature I have, and when do I do this? So this is where the loop closes for them. And again, it goes back from then again, monitoring, predict and adjust. So that's how IoT and machine learning are going, are leading to agriculture 3.0 and eventually will lead to close this loop where we expect uh, a fully autonomous farm operation at scale will be possible. And this is a game changer as of right now, as we understand that. So with that, uh, we talked about a lot of futuristic things, but where are we right now as a company? So we'll kind of walk you through quickly uh, our solution as well. So uh, we're a three and a half year old company as we, as we talked about. Uh, we work with, uh, with farmers across Canada, North America. We have some uh, customers in Europe and Brazil and Argentina as well. Uh, and the services that we provide them, the solution that we have built is a platform, as, is an analytics as a service platform where on the left hand side, the whole idea is, and we saw the sensors there, 
So there are different sensors that we're connecting with. We're collecting weather data from that. We are also collecting soil data. We're collecting crop data and we're creating all these data streams. This data streams is coming to us. And what we do is we combine plant science and machine learning uh, in building solutions uh, or algorithms that are for different crops. So right now we work with, so with soybean crop, uh, wheat, uh, canola, uh, and potato crop, and we're entering corn. And what we can tell growers uh, by, with these algorithms and reading this stream of data is uh, the, 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 the possibility there can be a disease attack in about three to five days, or in certain cases, even two weeks out, there can be. We can forecast that uh, how fast a crop is growing in their field and different fields, and then what is the action they can take along with that. So based on combining all this information, growers have started to uh, manage the logistics of running their farm operation at scale with this information. And in doing so, what they're realizing, they're using less water, they're using less pesticide, uh, they're using less macronutrients. The result, however, their uh, crop yield is going up. And which is the, by, which is the definition of uh, achieving sustainable agriculture practices. So today we feed all this data directly through uh, to our app, which has, uh, we have a web-based system as well as uh, a mobile app through which we feed this directly. But we're in the process of connecting that to other farm management systems that growers use. So there's no data duplication. Uh, another thing that we're kind of working on right now and uh, hopefully soon uh, as well. So one of the things when we, when we build these solutions and we give it to growers, and because these are all predictive solutions, we ask growers, hey, did you observe this on the field? So when we suggest it, when we tell, our uh, systems tell you that, you know, five fields are gonna be at certain growth stage for a plant, that actually happened. And today farmers tell us, no, it didn't happen, or yes, it didn't happen. And based on their feedback, all these algorithms, they're adapting in real time. Uh, and they're they are becoming very specific to that each and every field. It's almost like each field is running its own, own version of an algorithm. Uh, but getting user data is hard. And uh, it is hard to engage people when they're busy. So we're trying to now link imagery, which is either through uh, satellite and UAVs and et cetera. So we can, we can, we can automate even the adaption, or the field adaption of these algorithms. So that's something we're working towards uh, and connecting that to some of the smart equipment, which is like the John Deere equipment we talked about. So we aim to achieve that within the next one year. So with that, uh, we, we want to talk a little bit about IoT and machine learning sounds really cool. That's amazing. So much they can do. So what's the catch here? So the catch here is there are challenges. Uh, so we'll talk about onboarding IoT sensors. It's one thing that you, when you're trying to uh, build these solutions and, and then trying to test out in a lab environment or in a city environment. So where we work in most of the time, that's not the scenario. We are, our farm, the farms are stretched all over the place and mostly several kilometers away from even the closest Tim Hortons. So that kind of gives you an idea. So when you think about that, the biggest challenge is, is, uh, is connectivity. So, and, and on that, let's talk to the life cycle of these sensors. The first one is onboarding IoT sensors. So as of right now, when you, when you try to uh, get certain sensors, what you probably do is end up doing is manually configuring each and every device to, uh, to work with your, with your networks. Now that is fine when you're working with a couple of users or a couple of, uh, at, a, at an early state. In fact, that's how I would strongly encourage you to do so. Because if you're spending a lot of time in automating that, you probably are building a device, which, a solution, which you don't know if that's gonna resonate well with your customers yet. So don't try to solve a problem which you don't have yet. What what we uh, what Riyadh and I we when we were working on this what we what we ended up doing eventually is because there are so many devices we we automated the whole process of onboarding the system. So today these there are two types of devices we have. So one is one has a barcode and you scan that with our solution and it automatically connects with our network and it gets a geospatial awareness. That's a hard thing to do. Um, uh, the second side, given a hard thing in the sense that connectivity is an issue and it's almost like a moving target wherever you're going. The second thing is uh, designing for failure. The reality of IoT sensors and after dealing with hundreds, uh, thousands of, at least thousand plus devices that we've seen so far, devices disconnect sometimes for no good reason. They just disconnect and then they come back. And in the meanwhile, you do lose data and, and, you know, and it doesn't help that all these are in the farm. So 
you have to design for the failure. What happens when a device disconnects? What happens when one sensor out of the 10 sensors on a device disconnect? So you need to think about that. Uh, next one is, as you try to uh, work with commercial customers, well, very soon, and we are not a sensor company. We don't build a weather station or the sensors or any of that. We are a software analytics company. So when we work with customers, we always get a quest. Well, I've already invested several hundred thousand dollars in these kind of equipment. Can you not work with this equipment? So then the process is, so how do you start working with these different manufacturers who are following different standards? Uh, so that's another challenge that, that we, we, we're dealing with. We're still dealing with that. Uh, we have strategies in, in, in which you're onboarding one vendor at a time to become a, vent, a device agnostic platform. Uh, but, that, that, but that is something if you're ever dealing with IoT sensors and depending on your strategy, if you're trying to stay purely on the software analytics side, you strongly want to consider what's your strategy going to be there. And, and lastly, uh, this is something that happens during the summertime because that's where the main agriculture season is, managing IoT sensors. Sometimes devices fail, and the worst thing that can happen is we have to call someone and say, hey, can you go to that farm, which is about 150 kilometers from you, and just go reset that device? That's pretty bad. So what we started now doing is, first, we started to pre even predict when a device can, can, can fail, and what are the events that lead to failure? So the sooner you start achieving that state, and you can set better expectation with your customers, um, that may, that that can help you uh, in certain re automated resets you can do, which can avoid sensors from just disconnecting because you know, sometimes just the network side to it and the other side, it's just the LoRa, the local network that you have between the sensor and the gateway. Uh, but it's, this is also another uh, point where managing IoT sensors is, 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 can be painful. And now let's talk a little bit about building and scaling machine learning solutions. So, as we talk about so much data, the next natural step is, okay, so you're receiving all this, all this data and your sensors are disconnecting, the device are going offline. So clearly the quality of data is not going to be that great. And, and that, that's true. We have that issue time to time, the quality of data is limited and really hard to get. So we do uh, impute data and where it gets uh, game tricky. And this, and Ria has kind of designed this whole workshop around this, this particular point. Uh, is defining the boundary between imputing versus extrapolating. So let's say a device disconnected for a couple of hours. And is that something that can you, can you uh, impute? Uh, but for until how long is it is okay to do so? And if there, a device comes back, well, in between you can do that, but then the calculations that were supposed to run on for the algorithms, uh, now they can be off. So there, there has to be some trade off boundaries when you go to a different approach for that. Uh, and it, it honestly depends on use case to use case, but that is something uh, you will realize as soon as you start going in at a, at a certain scale and in field outside the experimental state. Next thing we're, we're also realizing is that the data privacy is a concern across uh, commercial, commercial farms as well as enterprise that you're dealing with. So um, each farm at this point has their own secret recipe, which leads to a certain level of uh, you know, successful crops. And they want to preserve that recipe. And, and when we try to pull all this data and we you know, try to combine all this, we do get question, we do get questions on okay, so how what are you going to be doing with my data? How is that going to be used? Uh, are you helping with my competition in this way? So this is where when you when you think about building machine learning based solutions, do give a thought about data privacy side to it, but that if someone doesn't want to be included, what is the strategy going to be there? And that leads to the next point, as things get more complex, you're building models or even you know, feeding the input of one model into another model. And as things get, keep on getting that, that complex, it can become hard to explain model behavior. So I'll give you a very practical example sometime we deal with. Uh, our models are for growth stages. We can forecast, they're running a couple of models and then they all uh, assemble. And then based on that, they give an output for a given place, given geography, et cetera. And then some of the question get asked, well, why is it suggesting this stage versus some else I want to see? And if we, and in that point, it sometimes gets really hard to explain that. And it takes us quite a bit of time to understand why did model behave one way over the other. Uh, and, and 
this this when we see this becoming more and more complex over time and uh and, and that's where the another thing is sometimes you can have models that will have a uh, very high accuracy rate but you'll have a very hard time explaining that model behavior why is it doing or why is it pick, picking certain parameters over other there are certain techniques out there uh that you can deploy in order to try to understand that uh but that again depends on your use case and what level and depth of the questions you're going to get so I'll, I'll take a pause there because the next step from here is a perfect segue for Ria to talk, jump more into the machine learning hands-on uh, workshop. But hopefully this gives you a good context uh, of not only the agriculture industry, but also where industry is going and the technology that is making that happen, the combination of IoT and machine learning. Okay, um, is there any question for Abhi? If not, then I can take over. Okay, um, then I'll share my screen. Um, yes, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, before uh, we go into the workshop, the hands-on tutorial part, I just want to show you the demo we are, the project we are doing with Encore and how we are using or planning to use 5G for our devices. And uh, this is uh, the setup currently looks like uh, the demo we have set up for uh, 5G test bed, and this is our devices, and these devices send data through this protocol called LoRa. And this black box you are seeing, uh, there's the gateway. So this gateway uh, captures the data sent by the devices, and which in turn sends this data to our server over the internet. And uh, this is the device that's been given by Encore. Uh, this is kind of like the Um, okay, okay, uh, yeah, so this is the device uh, that's uh, from Encore, and um, this is the device that facilitates uh, accessing the fiber test network. And um, I'm gonna show you, it's not going to be like a very live demo, but uh, the data we are receiving through 5G network uh, from the test bed that, as you can see, this is kind of like a log uh, on our server, and this is like a demo server. And these are the, as you can see, these are the timestamp. Uh, this is the device ID. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> the data is coming in. This is the device ID. You can see the timestamp, and these are actual data. And uh, of course, because this is the device data, these are very highly complex binary data. So what we have to do you know, on our end that take this binary data and actually extract uh, the relevant information like temperature, relative humidity or whatnot. And um, this work has been done mostly with the help of um, the Encore engineer, Kasim, and my co-worker, Alejandro. So uh, thanks to them. I have done very minimal work on this. And um, does anyone have any questions on this uh, test network? Uh, sorry, 5G test bed, how, how we have set up? Anything related to this? Okay. I don't see any questions in the uh, the chat at the moment. Okay, sorry, we don't have any questions left. Okay, um, okay. Then we can continue. Um, I'll probably give you a walk through the prerequisite material you'll need for this workshop. And uh, the first part is the weather data you'll need because you need you need, to, you, you need data for train and test. And uh, I hope you already have that uh, data available or we can uh, press to paste this in chat. And yeah, this is the weather data from one of our real life test devices. And you can always download this data from raw. Yes, so now you have the link and you can play with this data whenever you want. And the second thing I want to show you, um, this is called Google Colab. So if you Google for Google Colab, you can find this. And 
Uh, one of the good things about Google Colab that this is totally hosted platform, so you don't need to set up anything. Pretty much the whole Python environment, the Jupyter Notebook environment, and all the popular packages are already installed. And also one of the cool thing about this is that they have a CPU. So yes, so if you want to do any kind of deep learning or very hardcore machine learning training, you can always use that GPU and it's free. Okay, and the other thing I want to show you that uh, if you want to save a copy of this uh, notebook, you can always do that, save a copy in Drive, that's one option. And the other option is you can always download the actual notebook itself. Okay, so I think uh, we are good to go. From. Right, we had, before we go ahead, um, we do have one question for, from okay. Jeff. Yeah. And uh, it is around um, the uh, the range of 5G network. So how far is the range of uh, most, um, I guess, 5G antennas and for, for IoT devices? And for example, let's say you, you want to cover an entire city block size, uh, would your system be effective at covering that area? Um, I'm not a 5G expert. Uh, but uh, it depends which band uh, uh, you are using. But uh, one thing I can tell is uh, the task that we are using that's very limited because of the uh, government restriction. However, in real life, 5G can have huge amount of range, uh, way more than current 4G. But the exact number, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, the number on my hand. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Before I go in, uh, I, I, I'll have to, I, I'll just acknowledge that all the images are actually collected from internet. That's not from me. And um, so I think everyone knows what a machine learning, what machine learning is. Uh, I'll right, jump right into how machine learning is different from traditional systems, right? So. This is on the left hand side, your traditional system. You run some, you have some code and you run some tests and you deploy. And when you deploy, you monitor for any kind of error. But on the right hand side, as you can see, the amount of complexity for a machine learning system, because uh, you now, not only you need code, you need data, you need model, model training, and then just data is not enough. You have, to have like a valid, like a certain amount of data with valid, at least certain amount of accuracy. And then even when you are deploying this into production, you actually have to look for whether the training data you had and the data you see from the customers in real life in production, is there huge discrepancy, right? Because the data you are training on, if that data is different from the data you are actually seeing in real life, then your model is not going to work or the accuracy is going to suffer. So that's why like in machine learning software system that we have all these uh, extra components and huge amount of complexity. So what I'll try to do, I'll try to uh, touch on at least some of the parts in this tutorial and um, yeah, and this is not going to be like kind of like a Hollywood type tutorial that you just type few lines and everything works. We'll actually look in, in depth, uh, like a, 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 the nature of the data, try to have understanding of the data and how we can use our understanding of the data to develop an actual model. Um, the second uh, is kind of similar to the first image. The only thing I want to show you that uh, how small the ML code is in a machine learning system that how small the ML code is. So a very small part of your whole product life cycle, ML product life cycle would be actual ML code and the rest of the effort will be invested in actually just the data collection, data validation part or like when you are deploying the model into production, how you can validate that everything is working fine because uh, one of the problem in any kind of data product or machine learning product that uh, the data can go corrupt or errors can go unnoticed really easily. And we face this problem pretty much every single day. So this is something you have to be really aware of that how much monitoring tools you have to double up. So the next step is uh, time series. What is a time series? So a time series, uh, very simply speaking, is a 
sequence of observation where you have a temporal component to it, right? So what, what's the easiest example of a time series? Uh, the easiest example is, uh, as what we've been speaking so far, is weather data, right? When we talk about weather, we just we just don't talk about temperature. We actually talk about what's the temperature now, what's the temperature tomorrow, is it going to rain tomorrow? There's always a temporal component to it. And uh, forecasting, time series forecasting is, is quite simple. Based on historical data, can you actually forecast? what the data will look like in future, right? It's a prediction problem. And uh, what are the techniques for time series forecasting? So these are the few techniques we have for time series forecasting. Um, of course, this is not exhaustive or all inclusive, but um, as you can see that um, in here, you have techniques from both steps or ML community. So moving average linear regression, ARIMA, ETS, there, these are more from uh, steps community, then you have more advanced, more complex, and not necessarily better. It depends on the domain. You have recurrent neural network or uh, convolutional neural network. These are deep learning based techniques. Um, each of this group has its pros and cons. If you want to double up, uh, if you have like a lots of data, then you should probably look into deep learning based techniques. Uh, if you don't have much data, but your data is probably good quality, then uh, you should probably look into steps techniques, but it all depends on the use case. But these are kind of like the general rules. And um, the one resource I recommend, particularly if you want to learn forecasting uh, from uh, their side is uh, this book, it's online. And this is one of the probably uh, most influential person uh, in steps community, like time series forecasting community right now. So yeah, the link is there. So please have a look. Uh, okay. So uh, before we try to think about time series forecasting that we also need some answers, right? Uh, uh, we, we, we need to answer these questions that, the first very first question is, can it be forecasted? That just because there is a time series, is it possible at all to forecast? Um, one simple example is, uh, is it possible to forecast weather for next year based on the data we have right now? Uh, probably not, in a very good chance, it's probably not going to be possible. You can forecast the climate but to some extent, but the weather, it's almost impossible. So you have to be realistic that what we can forecast and what we cannot. And um, the thing about that, like what are the, sorry, let me just, what are the dependent variables? What are the dependent variables? What are the independent variables that we want to forecast? And who, what are the variables that are going to uh, impact our forecast? And um, things like uh, how, how, how much into the future we want to forecast the forecast horizon. Is it one week or is it a month or is it a year? Uh, what's the frequency? Is it hourly? So weather is usually hourly, but if you want to forecast sales, that might be daily, weekly, or even yearly, then the one of the most important question is how can we validate this model, right? Or what would be our evaluation metric? What would be our testing methodologies? Or how can we validate this model when we are actually serving real life customer data? So these are very important questions and it all depends on the on your problem domain. And uh, this is a slide I really like. The only reason I included this slide, I copied it from some, some place, but the only reason I included this slide is uh, just because of this quote that if time series forecasting is similar to driving a car by using the rear view mirror. Right? So that kind of implies that how hard it is to forecast time series and you actually have to find some invariant that holds true in the past, and that will hold true also in the future. That's the only time uh, you can actually forecast time series. And as a, as a domain expert, this is where your expertise is valued because only you can, val you can validate that the invariant we are seeing, the constant factors we are seeing, are they actually, do they actually hold true or is this some kind of very spurious correlation? So uh, I will take a pause here. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far before we jump into the coding part?
No other questions at the moment in the chat either. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I'll probably not going to code along. I'll probably focus more on the concept and the output side. Um, for this uh, um, tutorial, these are the packages you need. So you can just copy paste it. And uh, if you want to run a cell, that's how we run a cell. So yes, um, yeah, it is going to be installed. So everything I've already, I think I've already installed. So, but uh, for you, it might be different because it hasn't been already installed. Okay, so everything is installed. We are good to go. Um, these are very simple. You see some importing things, um, nothing much to explain here. Uh, the second part is now we are actually reading the weather data into a pandas data frame. So one of the good things about pandas is it can actually read data directly from an URL. So that's what we are doing. Uh, so this is the data that looks like here. Uh, it's always good to have good to have a look at your data and whether everything at least from visually speaking whether everything looks okay so uh, so far um very hard to tell but nothing catches your eye the next step is we are going to look into it's kind of like a exploratory data analyze analysis a feature extraction data preparation they have the kind of like data cleaning they have kind of different names but they're all pretty much mean the same thing so uh, uh, I'll just uh, briefly talk about how important it is to do this work. And uh, this is a slide uh, from uh, uh, director of AI uh, at Tesla, who is actually working on a self-driving car. And this is the actually his own experience that how much time he used to spend uh, during his PhD, just looking at the data set or trying to un understand the data set. And this is the time he's actually is pending when he's working on a real life problem. And self-driving car is probably at the forefront of our knowledge in machine learning. So you can understand that how important it is to just to look at data. And um, there are some blog posts I, just, I included just to uh, drive home the point, how important it is. And um, yeah, these are a couple of research paper. They're, they're very easy to read. So please have a look. Uh, okay. The, Coming back to the data preparation side, that um, what we'll do, we'll we know we have timestamp, so we have, we'll have to explicitly convert the timestamp, and we'll also do some very simple slicing. So instead of looking at the whole data, we'll only look at from first of June to first of September, I think. Yes. So yeah. Okay. This is where everything goes wrong. I have to run this. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> that's working fine. Okay, yeah, so yeah, as you can see, the data, uh, we are properly sliced the data. The first reading is first of June, uh, the second reading, uh, last reading is first of September. Okay, the next step we will look at that is there any missing data uh, in our uh, data frame, right? So in pandas, you can easily do this by just uh, yeah copying this code. Uh, so as you can see, if I run this zero zero zero, that means there's no missing data so far. Um, so before I go into what are the cases whether where we will have missing data. So in real life, if we are manually collecting data, uh, one way is someone forgot, or sometimes you just don't have the answer, right? Um, in in terms of IoT, uh, the devices, uh, missing data is fairly common and it's one of the biggest uh, problems we face all the time. And oh, the one reason of why it can happen is um, for some reason the device is disconnected from the internet, right? Or the device is probably disconnected from the cell tower. Uh, uh, or the coverage is not good, so the device went offline, and the next time, like probably a few hours later, the device came back online. So now you have to, uh, a window of few hours where you don't have any data, right? So uh, right now, we don't have any missing data, but that can be actually very misleading. So we'll actually look into this now, that why it can be misleading. 
right? So one of the things, if you look at here, that uh, this is not the spacing between these two subsequent readings are actually not uniform, right? Um, they are not uh, at proper hour or the uh, latency, the time difference between them is exactly not the same. So what do you try to do uh, in general when you're trying to analyze, analyze time series, you need to actually convert into something like every minute, every hour or every week or daily. So what we'll do for this that we'll convert into hourly and pandas have this method called resample. So the link for the documentation is here. Uh, you can check the documentation. Um, so if we execute it now, you can see that everything is actually hourly, right? And uh, for temperature, we are taking the average. And for relative humidity, we are taking the average. And for rainfall, we are taking some. So, okay, everything is here, okay, properly. Now, what we'll try to do, we'll try to visually inspect the data. And there's this package called pandas profiling. It's very handy. You don't have to write any, I mean, you have to write like a few lines of code, just pretty much copy paste. And then you will have like a very beautiful HTML report that you can actually see, you know, uh, visually inspect your data. So yeah, in here you can see number of variables is four, how many observations you have, do you have any missing data? As you can see, after we have converted it to hourly, for some hours, we actually have missing data, right? And uh, how much of the data is missing? Um, and like, what's, what are the variable types? How many data and columns? How many numeric columns do you have? Um, let's look at the temperature. So if you look at, now there's a really nice histogram. And what we know about temperature, or in many cases, a real life phenomenon, they actually, uh, follow a bell curve pattern or Gaussian distribution. So it kind of goes with our expectation that, yeah, this is this actually looks like a Gaussian distribution. It's the bell curve. So this that's, that's the one form of data validation right there. Um, you can look at the extreme values, whether it makes sense. So minimum is uh, eight, like eight degrees Celsius, maximum is 40. So these are kind of like uh, suspicious values because uh, in Sean or the temperature usually doesn't hit 40. So this is something we have to actually look at that. Uh, is your sensor uh, reporting invalid or wrong values? It, it does happen in real life and you have to keep an eye on it. And even if your sensor is working properly, sometimes people are moving the sensors or touching the sensors. That's also when they report wrong values. So this is something you have to keep uh, keep an eye on it. And uh, yeah, so you can also look do the same similar analysis for relative humidity and rainfall. Um, the other thing is that what happens in real life that even if you have these readings, sometimes the re these readings, these different variables, they have interactions between them, right? So what, what I mean by interactions is, Usually, they are not independent of each other. Independent of each other, usually one variable actually have an impact on the other variable, right? So one of the things we know about temperature and relative humidity that for a specific geography, all else being equal, if temperature increases, relative humidity decreases, right? Because that's written in the relative humidity equation. So the data we are seeing does it follow that? Uh, wisdom we have, uh, it kind of does, as you can see, that there's kind of like an inverse relationship between relative humidity and temperature. So uh, makes sense, the visual inspecting kind of makes sense. Um, there are a few other correlation, uh, you can check it on your own time. You're not probably not going to spend too much time on it. And coming back to the missing values, um, as you can see, um, timestamp, there's no missing values, rainfall, there's no missing values, but there are some missing values for temperature and relative humidity. Okay, so the, our next step would be how we can impute, so how we can compute missing values. That would be the, our next step. And okay, let's go there. And okay, so if, we, if you want to see what are the timestamps, you have the missing values. Yeah, so as you can see that these are the timestamps. 
we have the missing values. Okay, so um, before um, the process of computing the missing values, uh, that's an important, it's called imputation. Uh, before I go to the imputation part, does anyone have any questions so far? Still no questions on the chat either. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so we'll we'll look into imputation. Um, um, yeah, luckily I got this image from internet that kind of also talks about temperature. <laughs> okay, so uh, in this chart, uh, all the red car you are seeing that's the um, temperature you are seeing from the device and uh, the blue line, that's the missing one. And uh, through imputation, they have computed the missing value, right? So this is a process we call imputation. And imputation can be from very simple to all the way to very, very complex machine learning model. Um, uh, one simple way you can do imputation is it's called average. Right, so you take the average of the temperature and you just say like, hey, anytime you see a missing value, you just assign the average, right? That's one way to do it. Uh, there are a few others. Um, if you go into here, let me show you very, very, very quick. Sorry. Here that how many different types of imputation method available that nearest means that whatever nearest available method just take that you can simply assign zero um, you can try to fit a curve and the curve can be quadratic cubic or spline um, the one we'll use for this tutorial um, is called piecewise polynomial um, so piecewise polynomial usually means that uh, this is a piece from here to here, this is one piece, and you try to fit a polynomial just for this one window of missing data. So that's why it's called piecewise polynomial. Okay, let's try that. So, okay, we have tried it. Uh, we have interpolated the data. Now, are we seeing any missing values? No. So, okay, it's good. Our interpolation was on point. The next thing is um, we'll try to visualize the data uh, as a time series, no longer Gaussian uh, like histogram. So, uh, yeah, pandas have very useful math, but you just call plot, and they just it's there. Okay. So, uh, what, what what do we know about temperature? The temperature has a daily cyclical, right? Usually, during daytime temperature goes up, during nighttime temperature goes down. Do we see that cycle here? Yes, we do. I mean, it's not perfect, of course, but we do see the cycle here. So kind of makes sense. Um, the other thing is what we also know about summer in North America, right? In summer, the temperature kind of goes up. Uh, as you can see, the trend is pretty much there. The temperature is going up, kind of is staying relatively set and it's kind of sort of going down. So, okay, that makes sense. Uh, in terms of relative humidity, if we plot relative humidity, um, does it make sense? Because relative humidity also has a similar pattern, cyclical, right? So it makes sense. Um, if we look into the rainfall, okay, so now visually, can we say that is there any problematic values here? I mean, problematic is too hard to say, uh, it's too early to say, but as from visually inspecting, as you can see, that there's 25, so this is in millimeters, so that's 25 mm rain in here. And um, that can be a very easily, some, there's some kind of miscalculation or sensor malfunctioning somewhere. So that's why you have to visually inspect this data to understand that is there any outlier or noise or missing values in your data. So the next thing we'll look at is called outlier detection. Um, I will take the easy way out for here, easy way out here. Uh, one of the very simple way to do outlier detection is uh, 
you that's where your domain knowledge comes in that I can tell in summer, in Toronto, anything below five degrees Celsius is probably a wrong reading or it might be noise, right? So what I'm doing here, I'm kind of cliffing it. So anything below five degrees Celsius, set it five. So that's what I'm doing here. And that's, that brings us to our first exercise um, is how we can do outlier detection a bit more complex way. So um, this is the way we probably do. It's called uh, standard score or D score. Um, this equation is pretty simple for every data point. You can calculate Z score based on mean and a standard deviation. And then once you calculate the Z score, uh, then you can choose the cutoff point, right? Anything more than 4Z, like in here, anything more than 4Z, you can say, hey, they're outliers. So it shouldn't be that hard to do. Um, I also included the uh, link to the method you'll need to complete this assignment, standard deviation and mean. And the here, a very almost same using SQL. So it's pretty much the same exercise using SQL. So uh, you can use that as a reference point for your exercise. Okay, uh, now what we'll look into is trend detection. As I was talking about trend uh, in the temperature example, that during summer, usually temperature goes up, right? And trend detection is also important, not only that, like even if you are like outside of IoT, even if you're doing business analysis or you're trying to figure out how is your business doing, you can you, you need some sort of trend detection, right? Like uh, are you actually acquiring more customers or your are you, or is your user engagement going down? Uh, so for this kind of analysis, trend detection becomes very handy. Uh, so um, for trend detection, we'll do something very similar as we have done before. Before it was hourly, we'll try to make it daily because now the trend becomes easier to find out. And uh, for trend detection, we'll use uh, this feature. Um, let me go there. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So um, if you are from electrical engineering background, I think you know about filter way better than me. The only thing uh, I'll probably cover that uh, there are different types of filter uh, based on the time series. It can give you the cycle. Is there any cyclical component? Uh, in the time series, and is there any trend component in the time series? And uh, like everything else, uh, please take it with a grain of salt because there are very other parameters that you can uh, manipulate to find out the cycle and trend. So it all based on how you are changing the parameters of these algorithms. But however, if you are using default parameters, uh, let's see how it looks like. So um, in here, as you can see, oh, let me actually run this code. Okay. Okay. So it's here. Okay. So in here, as you can see that this is the temperature, daily temperature. Um, the trend kind of makes sense. Right. Uh, the temperature is going up. It peaks around mid-July. Then it slowly starts to go down. So it makes sense. Um, the cyclical component doesn't, not so much. So uh, this is another take home message probably that sometimes the, just because you're running algorithm and algorithm giving you some output, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be correct. So that's where your domain expertise comes in that you have to actually make sure that uh, the output of the algorithm actually matches your domain expertise, what you actually know about real world. So we can safely ignore the cycle part, but uh, the trend part holds up, so it looks good. The next step is now we have done all the exploratory data analysis. We have really good idea about our data, and we also validated whether our data 
is aligned with the other with the knowledge we have so that's good now the next step is evaluation that how are you going to evaluate once we have an algorithm model running right so uh, in real world evaluation is going to be one of the hardest part because a lot of times you're probably not going to have proper data from the customers to evaluate your models or in fact, in real world, a lot of times it's not even possible to actually have that data. So you'll have to have different types of proxy metrics to actually try to figure out or have a good estimate for the actual uh, performance of your model. But for this case, for the sake of this tutorial, we'll talk about a very simple uh, two kinds of uh, evaluation. Uh, one, this, this, the first one is known as expanding window. So this is your training. So this is all the data you have. This is your training data, and this is the test data. Uh, next iteration, you expand the window of your training data. You keep the testing data window fixed, but you keep expanding the training data window. So yeah, so that's why the name says that it's expanding window. Uh, there's another one. It's kind of like rolling fixed window, as you can see from the visualization that you are actually not expanding the input window. What you are doing, you are just like moving it. You are kind of rolling it. Okay, so that's one of the evolution strategy. And uh, what are the metrics? So uh, lots of different metrics. It all depends on your domain. But uh, one of the common ones is RMSC. So RMSC is not even for time series, it's for pretty much every single machine learning algorithm. You'll use one of the metrics as RMSC. It's a fairly common. The other one, this is the one we'll probably focus on because this, this brings more about, like it's more interpretable in the context, in this particular context that's what we call mean absolute percentage error. So what it means is usually it's very simple, is you take the percentage error for every single data point and you take the average. So that's what this equation is. Um, okay, coming back there, um, this is a method that implements this mean absolute percentage error. So we'll just do it. Okay. The next step is, as we talked about here, uh, how many steps, steps mean how many uh, observation points, right? How many steps we'll use as input, how many steps we'll use for forecasting, for our testing. So uh, for this, we can use 24, that means single day. Input steps, seven multiplied 24, that means one week. So we'll take one week of training data and we'll try to predict uh, one day of forecasting. So. Okay, so um, this is just like some simple slicing and dicing. Um, now, now to the actual algorithm. So the algorithm will cover, the first algorithm will cover is called exponential smoothing. Um, it's very, very simple. It's just weighted average. As you can see from this formula, it's pretty much just an weighted average. The reason why we are using a very simple algorithm so one of the first things you have to know about machine learning that whenever you are starting a new project, the very first thing you should always do is use the simplest algorithm possible. The reason is uh, one is simplest algorithm will give you a baseline, right? Because if you are using a complex algorithm, but it's not doing better than your simplest algorithm, then probably there is something wrong or you'll probably switch back to the simplest one. So that gives you a proper baseline. The second is simplest algorithm is easier to deploy, easier to develop, easier to explain. The third is that it also gets you, as a startup, it also gets you to the market fast. You can easily deploy something easily, then in the meantime, you can also develop more complex algorithm. And coming back to the exponential smoothing, and just to show you how simple algorithm, how effective they can be. So, um, what happened? Not sure. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why this link is not loading. GitHub is not loading. It's very interesting. <laughs> okay, but again. 
Um, am I connected to the internet? Can everyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, I'm sorry what's happening right now. I'm not sure why these links are not loading, but anyway, let's <laughs> continue this conversation. Okay, uh, so M4 competition is uh, the the most important competition in time series forecasting. So they have this uh, time series and different uh, academic or research group uh, so submit their own algorithms. And you know, they, at the end of the competition, the best one usually that comes out. So one of the thing about Uber, uh, I think the last competition called M4, Uber won that competition. One of the data scientists at Uber and he won the competition with a combination of this uh, exponential smoothing and the deep learning method called a re recurrent neural network. So that kind of gives you the idea that how powerful this simple method can be. Okay, so now, uh, the, now we have the test we have the test data, we have the training data. Uh, one of the other concepts we'll try to briefly cover is called data drift or covariate drift, or it's also known as concept drift. What it usually means, as I was talking about earlier, that during training, you have this distribution of data, but what can happen in real life that now the distribution has shifted, right? Uh, the data is now different. The nature of the data is different. So the the model you are deployed or developed is no longer valid in a real world. Can anyone give me an example uh, when it can happen? Um, I'll give you a hint. We are leaving this case right now. Okay. Um, any model you de develop pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, uh, probably is not valid during pandemic, particularly if you are working in business, any kind of business analytics part. If you were uh, trying to forecast how many passengers are, you're gonna have before pandemic for your airline, during pandemic, this model is no longer valid. That's why it's so important that because uh, real life things can change and your model can get invalid anytime. So that's why we have to check this, we have to have these checks and balances that is there any data drift? Uh, so for that, uh, is there any data drift between the tra training data and testing data? Uh, we'll use this package called SweetBees. Uh, it's similar to Pandas profiling. It's very simple, only two lines of code you can see. And in here, as you can see, the blue ones are the training data. The yellow ones are from, from the testing data. As you can see, there's actually some difference between distribution of training data and testing data, right? Because you have training data for this range, but there's no test data but there's no huge amount of discrepancy. So I think we are good to go, but please, uh, when you are deploying model in real life, please actually have a very thorough look that if there's no data drift between the training data and testing data. Okay, so now we are actually getting to the real juicy part that we are trying to fit, an, fit a model to actually forecast temperature, right? So as you can see, the exponential smoothing, that's the algorithm we are using. Uh, we are saying we are providing the training data. We are also trying to inject some domain knowledge. So uh, we have talked earlier that uh, usually temperature has a daily cycle, right? And that's why 24, 24 hours, one day. We are also saying there is a trend, as we have observed before, there was a trend. We have also said the, the seasonality exists and as we have provided the parameter. Um, these are, I'll probably explain later, but anyway, so let's try to feed this or train this model and try to forecast. So let's click on it. Okay, so as it's a very simple model, right away you are seeing the result. So the result, there's nothing wrong, obviously, at least at the first glance, there's nothing wrong, everything looks fine. Okay, so now we'll, we'll see that how good was our, just the training part of the algorithm. So 
let's see. So as you can see in here, this is the temp, the blue one is the temperature. Uh, the yellow one was the treated value, the how how much algorithm actually try to fit this uh, real world value. As you can see, it's pretty close. Okay, good. Now we'll try to, this is the moment of truth. We'll try to figure out that what's the actual difference between the temperature and what we have forecasted. So let's see. So, okay, so this is the blue one is the actual, this. This, are, this was our test data. The forecast is the yellow. So, I mean, not the best, but as you can see, it can it still mimic the line at least. Of course, there's some there's a huge amount of error, particularly at the peak, but it can still mimic the line. So, not bad. Uh, now, this, this is the actual numbers. Um, so, the main error we are talking about the 13.76%. So the error is around 13.76%. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about actually, I'll very briefly cover it, is the same model as here. The ETS model is the same, is the same model here. Um, the only difference is that we didn't add any seasonality. We didn't add any seasonality. So how important it is to inject domain knowledge in your model. So since we haven't added any seasonality, uh, it, it's perfect, the training, but when you look at the forecast part, as you can see, it's a, it's a flat line. Right? So that's why it's important to actually inject the domain knowledge if it's possible. Um, the next model and the last model we'll try to cover is called additive models. And uh, one of the packages will follow I'm not sure why I don't have any internet. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Um, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm lost, sorry, I'm lost. I'm not sure why I don't have internet. <laughs> anyway, something has to go wrong when you're that way. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, Facebook Profit is a time series forecasting model. Um, uh, not a model, it's actually a package developed by Facebook. It's actually quite popular, particularly in business domain. Um, and it, in the profit, there is a family of model. We call it generalized additive models. Uh, what it usually means that uh, you try to, um, it will take some time to explain, but essentially it, what it means that you try to separate different components that uh, seasonal component, trend component, and any kind of error component, you try to separate them, you model them, each of them individually, then you combine them. So that's why the additive part comes in, that you separate the components, you forecast them individually, then you add them again. Um, I'll quickly uh, go over it, that uh, in this case, uh, we are trying to make the model more complex. That means last time our training window was only one week. Right, only one week of training data. Now we are making it two months of training data. So let's see how it performs. And there is also some data manipulation. So uh, to fit the format of profit. Okay. Um, okay. So as you can see now, this is the part we are forecasting. So it, it took quite some time because it's a bit more complex. Uh, this is a forecast you can see that uh, the benefit of the uh, complex models that they also give you a confidence interval. So you have the y hat, that's the forecast, and y hat lower and y hat upper is the interval, is the 95% confidence interval. Okay, um, let's try to plot the components. So up to this point, these are the training data after this any black dots, that's the forecast. Uh, everything looks fine in here. Um, can we see the trend component? So if you compare these two, at least trend-wise, this kind of makes sense because trend is usually going down, right? It kind of looks like it's going down. So in here, it, it goes down. So that part is good. Uh, the bad part is the weekly seasonality and daily seasonality. Yeah, that part is not that good. So again, uh, anything output is an output of an algorithm can also be a bad output. Just because it's 
given by a machine learning algorithm doesn't mean it's all good. Uh, now, let's look at the data, the forecast, the quality of forecast itself. Uh, visually speaking, it looks way better. At least the peak, the difference between peak is uh, narrower than the simple model we have used, exponential smoothing. Uh, if you look at now, let, let's look at the actual number, right? So this is the actual number, 7.69 or 7.7% of error, right? If we compare that to the our um, the simple additive model, it was 13.76. So it's probably, uh, I don't know, 40% of error reduction. So that's usually how it goes that you start with a very simple model and you see you set that as a baseline and then you try to have more and more complex models and see whether you are actually seeing an improvement in accuracy. Okay, and um, this will be the end of the uh, hands-on tutorial. Uh, the exercise number two is actually pretty simple that we have tried to predict the temperature. Now we have to predict relative humidity. And um, in terms of uh, readings, what, where you can go next, um, I, the, all of these three links are highly, extremely highly recommended. Um, they don't go into too much technical detail, but they give you like a very good overview. And not only that, as a company or as a startup, how you should approach machine learning. As I was talking about, the first model shouldn't be the most complex one. The first model should be the most simple one. So that's where this uh, different articles talk about, or as, an, as a company, what are the prerequisites for, a, for deploying a machine learning model, as I was talking about at the very beginning that do you have all these different infrastructure set up before you can deploy a machine learning model? Uh, do you have your monitoring or is there, a, how do you, how are you actually validating when your, data, or when your model is in production, right? All of this have to be answered, set up before you can actually deploy a machine learning model. So I will stop right here with the, uh, yeah, for the readings and that's probably the end of this tutorial. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, yes, please go ahead. Thanks Riyad. Um, so folks, I'm just wondering uh, if you have any questions, if you do, um, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, you can pose the, uh, your question uh, directly to Riyad and Abby. We'll leave the floor open for about a minute. All right, folks. Um, Riyad, I don't think we have um, any questions about the, uh, the demo you just did, but it was uh, very informative. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight to our audience um, is uh, if you have any questions about um, any of the stuff that was um, highlighted in, during the presentation today, we do have a, um, a service that is accessible to, uh, to, to community tech members um, that can help build on uh, what we covered today, which is our data growth coaching program. And basically our data growth coaches are experts in the various um, spaces that are available to um, meet with companies better understand their challenges and, and provide uh, some guidance. So in, we have five areas of uh, where they focus on really when it comes um, to the data. Um, um, we've started with um, data science. Uh, we have folks that are available to help talk about like uh, data strategy, especially when we're talking about like um, IoT devices or certain things that you need to, to, to have your, your models run. So um, partnerships can be um, uh, needed in certain industries. So for example, if you're trying to leverage um, 
um, weather data, for example, and things like that. Um, we have um, coaches that are able to help um, sort of like highlight and be, bring to the forefront some of the things to keep in mind um, as you are getting ready to release um, your product or any product updates. Um, a few other coaches focus on, uh, uh, on the deep learning side. Um, we have a few folks around um, spatial data and finally 5G. So our 5G coaches uh, work with companies around um, the network design side and the network administration side, for example, and can help answer any questions you may have. In addition to that, um, folks that are local and wish to access the 5G test bed um, at Communitech, we do have our support partners uh, from Ericsson, so a team of engineers that are also able to, um, uh, would be available to actually um, uh, meet you guys, with you guys when you're accessing the test bed and help answer any uh, um, questions and challenges that you're facing while on the 5G test bed. Um, so if you are interested in um, the data growth coaching, uh, you have my contact information, um, feel free to, to, to send me an email and uh, we'll, we'll try and make that happen for you guys. Um, before we head off um, um, today, one of the things that I wanted to do as well is I'm hoping that you can take two minutes to share um, uh, your feedback. I am currently posting a link to the, uh, the survey here in the chat. Um, so access to the Encore 5G services um, is provided thanks in part to sponsorship from the Ontario government. Under the terms of this program, companies are required to fill out a completion report after accessing any of our programs. And this information is an important indicator um, of the success of the program and it is used by the, the government of Ontario to assess um, program outcomes and assist uh, in um, future program development. Um, please help, uh, help us over at Community Tech to, uh, to, to continue our programs. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's a very brief survey. It should take about um, two minutes. And uh, we just ask um, anyone to um, answer the, uh, those questions to the best of their abilities, really. Um, all right, so thank you, Avi and Riyad, for offering uh, your time and effort to uh, prepare and deliver this uh, workshop today. Um, there was a lot of great information that you covered through the um, um, overview of the industry and also um, through that um, um, walkthrough of uh, the, the, the time series uh, tutorial. So uh, we really appreciate um, um, your time and effort for, for, for meeting with us uh, today. Um, to our audience, um, thank you very much uh, for joining us today for the uh, Real-Time IoT Analytics Workshop. Uh, we hope you found it very informative. And um, once again, I thank you all. Have a great day and stay safe. Thanks, everyone.